Good evening everyone, this is James Rattray of Soldiers of Killiecrankie. I told you I was going to tell you the story of the Battle of Killiecrankie and I'm going to use two books. Today I'm going to talk about what the commander of the Scottish Government Army, General Hugh Mackay, told us and also from the Jacobite side what the so you and Cameron of Loch Eel. I'm going to first of all also tell you about the location I'm standing in. Behind me, you can see the Pass of Killiecrankie, which is directly behind me here. If we swing around, we can see Benny Vraki at the top. And we swing further around, there's a slightly a hill, and then there's this one here with the, the trees on it, and that's the battlefield. And the that's where the Highlanders were, and you can see the severe the slope that where they came down um, off that field. What I'm going to do also now is just swing round and show you the, the landscape here, and we're going to swing with Killiecrankie behind us. I'm going to swing round, and just over the top of these buildings, if I can put my finger there. Whoops, how do I get it there? Up here is Blair Castle, and just about there. And the story that I'm going to tell you has a lot to do with Blair Castle. I mentioned to you I'm going to do this presentation of the story in, in a number of sessions, which allows me to walk over the battlefield and tell you what happened at each location. But one of the things that happens a lot is there's a lot of misunderstanding about the Jacobite Wars and how they happened and what, and what the causes were. So what I'm going to do in this session is talk to you first of all about the two monarchs and what was happening with them. I'm then going to talk about the two commanders, Hugh Mackay and Bonnie Dundee. And then finally I'm going to lead up to what actually caused the battle. I pointed out Blair Castle, and that has a big, one of the main reasons for the battle being here. But first of all, let me talk to you about the monarchs. The 1600s were a particularly turbulent time in Britain. Religion and kings believing in the God divine right to rule over people and nobody else having a, a say. I think a bit like the Pope used to be, I don't know. Charles I, lost his head 40 years before Killiecrankie in 1649 during the wars of the three kingdoms and what surprised me was that more people lost their lives in those wars of 1639 to 1651 than lost in proportion during the first world war that staggered me 29 years before the battle of Killiecrankie King Charles II was the monarchy was restored to the throne of England and Scotland. Charles lived until 1685, which is four years before the Battle of Killiecrankie. And he was a Protestant. He died, his brother, James the Seventh of Scotland and second of England, then came to the throne and he was a Catholic. There was much concern amongst the Protestants that a Catholic was back on the throne. And there were two factors that led to the problems that resulted in the war. First of all, when King, I'm going to call him James VII because we're talking about Scotland, came to the throne, he believed in the divine right of kings. And one of the first things he did was he prorogued the English Parliament, and we've heard about that just recently, um, to do with Europe. But he prorogued the English Parliament for one and a half years, and then he dissolved it in July 1687. He did the same with the Scottish Parliament, so neither Parliament met again until the year of 1689. And that was one big concern for a lot of the people. But the Protestants were relatively okay with him being king because his two daughters were married to Protestants and they felt that was okay. But 13 months before the Battle of Killiecrankie, James the seventh's wife gave birth to a son. <clears throat> and that really put the cat amongst the, 
Protestant pigeons. What then happened was that the, a number of senior English Protestants invited William of Orange and James VII's daughter, who, who, and William was a Protestant, to come over to England. And what happened was they landed at Tor Bay. So if you think Killiecrankie is up here, this is back to front, of course. <laughs> London's here, Tor Bay's here, and you landed at Tor Bay and marched up to London. And what then happened was that uh, James's army ran away. They deserted him. And the James ran away to France, leaving William and Mary in England and William of Orange's forces. So the English held, held a convention and said the fact that James had left and deserted his throne, he was no longer King of England. At that time, Scotland was a totally different country. The monarch was the same for the two. So up in Scotland, there was a different matter. It was a different story. I'll talk about that um, after I've told you about the two commanders and we'll go into the story up here in Scotland. So you've got James VII, one monarch, and you've got William and Mary, the other monarch, and each had their own commanders in Scotland. General Hugh Mackay was the William and Mary's champion, who was 49 years old at the time of the Battle of Killiecrankie. He was a Highland Scot, he spoke Gaelic, he, his ancestors, his descendants later became the chiefs of Clan Mackay. He spent many years in service with William of Orange in the Netherlands, and in fact married a Dutch lady and settled there. He's part of the Anglo-Scots Brigade. This was in the Dutch army. There were six regiments, three English regiments and three Scottish regiments. On the, in January 1689, six months before the Battle of Killiecrankie, he was commanded by William of Orange to command, take command of Scottish troops in Scotland. Mackay knows the other, his opponent, Viscount Dundee. They'd fought together in the con on the continent. Viscount Dundee, or as he later became known, Bonnie Dundee, was the James VII's champion. He was 41 years old, eight years younger than Mackay. His family were lowlanders. They had a um, lands just outside Dundee. He went to St Andrews University. He had a very close relationship with James VII, who created him a Viscount one month after his son was born, Dun Bonnie Dundee, and 12 months before the Battle of Killiecrankie. So there you have the two monarchs, you have their two commanders. First of all, I'm going to talk to you about General Hugh Mackay. And I thought maybe what I should do is when I'm going to talk about the, the different sides to help simplify the story. Mackay was with the regular army and I'm going to put a hat on to designate Mackay. He was part of the formal establishment and he came up here to Scotland and he wanted to do, do everything in line with the Scottish Convention, which was the equivalent of a Scottish Parliament. Perhaps part of it was because he was confident that William's supporters would win the day. And he, in his book, he tells us he was conferred upon himself command of all forces in the Kingdom of Scotland, that is. But we have a different story from Cameron of Lochiel. And I decided to put a nice woolly hat on with this, which is a bit more difficult to put on. I'm not going to put on a traditional blue bonnet because the white cockade and blue bonnet came later in the later Jacobite Wars. But Cameron of Lochiel, who was on the Highland side and fought with Bonnie Dundee, tells us writs for calling a convention of estates of Scotland but were put out. Many were afraid of the summons because it might be treason to attend it. So the numbers at the convention of Scottish 
estates was small. The convention looked like a committee rather than a representation of the kingdom. The first thing they did was to vote themselves a free parliament and then to offer the crown and, and government to Prince of Orange, Orange, which he graciously accepted. So that gives us a totally different side to the convention. Dundee, having failed to persuade the convention to support his king, James VII, he left Edinburgh in a hurry ahead of a company of 50 loyal dragoons off to raise support. And Cameron of Lochiel tells us he went to his house in Didhope near Dundee and there I, the Lord Lion heralded a, a, a trumpet and sent him after a council ordering him to return to the Council of Estates on the pain of high treason. Dundee sent a letter back saying his wife was expecting a child and he couldn't attend. But what also Cameron of Lochiel tells us, Dundee's retreat from the convention gave alarm to the whole nation. And lots of support came in for Dundee, many saying they'd risked their lives and fortunes under his command in King James's service. So I'm going to now go back to Mackay. Mackay wrote 38 pages of detail the four months leading up to the Battle of Killiecrankie. He complained about the lack of good men in his army, how he instructed local nobles and chiefs to raise men. He told how he had to divide his troops into certain areas of Scotland to try and make sure they didn't rise up. On one occasion, he talks about deserters coming into his camp and he felt they were spies from Dundee and he put them into custody until their foot stories could be checked. But he also told that Dundee's army was slowly growing and at one point he records there were 3,000 of them at Old Castle at Ruthven in Badenoch. But what does Cameron of Lochiel tell us? A bit more difficult that hat to put on. Cameron of Lochiel tells us, having had answers to, regarding Dundee, having had answers from the clan chiefs, they would not fail to wait on Dundee with their clans until the day of rendezvous. And Dundee would send an account to King James of the present circumstances of affairs, praying His Majesty to come over in person to Scotland. And the clans, united with the French auxiliaries, and the, would perform wonders and could outmaneuver any of the masters uh, of their enemies. So th this is a rather familiar story with all the Jacobite stories where the French are involved and they're always hoping the king would come. In another incident, Dundee, um, who was a lowlander, you remember, not a highlander, and he's trained in the regular warfare, just like Mackay. And when he is amongst the clans, Dundee, um, Cameron Love Lochiel tells us, Dundee being strengthened by the accession of the Macdonalds, made a proposal to his council of war, employing that the time they, they were waiting for the arrival of new clans that they should organize their men and discipline them. And Lochiel tells us the young chiefs and lowland officers highly approved of this motion. But Lochiel tells us he didn't. And he thought it was very unwise. Lochiel said, but Lochiel, now past his 60th year of age, was of a different opinion. He informed the council that as from his youth he had been bred among the Highlanders, and so he had among many observations upon their natural temper of people and their methods of fighting, that to pretend to alter anything in their custom where exceed the tenacity would entirely ruin them and make them no better than ordinary raised troops. He was firmly of the opinion 
that with their chiefs and natural captains at their head and under a, a general such as Lord Dundee, they were equal to any of the best disciplined veteran troops in the kingdom. I suspect that intervention by Lochiel was crucial, as we will see later on in this battle. So there you will have it. Both commanders gathering their troops and there was a lot of cat and mouse, both trying to ambush each other, both getting away. But it all came down to the men at Athol, just at Blair Castle where I was showing you. We know they're a shifty lot. And so let me tell you what Mackay says. Is that the right one? This is what Mackay says of the men of Athol. They had not openly declared themselves in support of, of William of Orange. The general's messengers, Mackay's own messengers, had been captured by the Athol men and intercepted their messages. And they'd been kept in the Marquis's house for three days. On another occasion, he concludes that the Marquis of Athol, with his people, are enemies of the government. Because you've got to remember, Mackay had been given command of Scottish forces in London by the Scottish Convention. So he was the, saw himself as the legally right commander. And he saw the Marquis of Athol and his people as enemies. He also goes on, he says, he is advertised by Lord Murray, the eldest son of the Marquis, that the castle had been taken over by Steward Balichen with some gentlemen from Angus adherents of Dundee's party <clears throat> and they'd fortified themselves in the house at Athol to secure the country for King James's interest and this was crucial as we will see shortly. Lord, George, Lord Murray said to Hugh Mackay that he had no hopes of persuading his men of Athol to join the king's forces against Dundee. Their inclination being more for King James than their majesty's government and said he would do his best to master the situation and prevent Dundee from recruiting his men. <clears throat> but Lord Murray then reported that when he went to the castle, the men would not let him in. Indeed, they sent messages to Dundee to bring the other Highland clans and to secure the castle. So this is exactly what happened. They then knew where the fight would take place. The Highlanders and Dundee marched as quickly as they can to, to get to Blair Castle. Mackay, who was in Perth at the time, St. Johnson as it was called, also with his three and a half thousand troops wanted to get up here as quickly as they can to get to Blair Castle to secure it. As I said at the beginning, on that slope up behind us where those trees are is, is the battle line where the battle took place. And behind me again, further round, is the pass of Killycrankie where they came through. So that set the scene of the battle. And what I'm going to do on Thursday at seven o'clock is, is I'll go to the pass of Killycrankie and tell you what happened there. What I will do, I've seen a lot of comments coming in and thank you very much for that. But I'm gonna, I'll answer these once I come away from here and answer them properly. So thank you very much indeed for watching and um, see you on Thursday, seven o'clock.